We're told that one of the greatest satisfactions in life is to become an exceptional performer. We see those who have achieved mastery in their field and view their work as something that for them has become complete play. But unless we're extremely fortunate, it can be difficult to find role models around us who have attained such heights. And this is a problem, as if we can't see what the journey to exceptional performance looks like, it's really difficult to imitate. Fortunately, there are a wealth of characters we can learn from out there, and one of the most staggering is Ender from the children's book of Ender's Game. This book has been a worldwide bestseller for decades, and it's easy to see why. The traits that Ender develops of leadership, aggression, and challenging the status quo are fundamental ideas that, if embodied, can really give us a fresh perspective on life, helping us to visualize what that road to exceptional performance looks like. Hey guys, how's it going? For those that are new to the channel, my name is Tom. I'm an entrepreneur working in startups in London. And in this channel, we aim to explore living with purpose and simplicity in a world of noise. This is the third edition of the Life Lesson series where we aim to distill lessons from really staggering characters, whether they be fictional or real. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the character of Ender from Ender's Game. I'll leave the timestamps here so you can jump about if you like. Let's get into it. One of the first traits that Ender embodies in this book that's made very clear from the start is his willingness to use extreme aggression when it's required. And to exemplify this point, I'm gonna read one passage from early on in the book where Ender is struggling with a school bully, but they did let go of him. And as soon as they did, Ender kicked out high and hard, catching Stilson square in the breastbone. He dropped. It took Ender by surprise. He hadn't thought to put Stilson on the ground with one kick. It didn't occur to him that Stilson didn't take a fight like this seriously and that he wasn't prepared for a truly desperate blow. For a moment, the others backed away and Stilson lay motionless. They were all wondering if he was dead. Ender, however, was trying to figure out a way to forestall vengeance, to keep them from taking him in a pack tomorrow. I have to win this now and for all time, or I'll fight it every day and it will get worse and worse. Ender knew the unspoken rules of manly warfare, even though he was only six. It was forbidden to strike the opponent who lay helpless on the ground. Only an animal would do that. So Ender walked to Stilston's supine body and kicked him again, viciously, in the ribs. Stilston groaned and rolled away from him. Ender walked around him and kicked him again in the crotch. Stilston could not make a sound. He only doubled up and tears streamed down his eyes. Now throughout the book, Ender is really plagued with self-hate for his capacity for this terrible, terrible violence. But there's no doubting its efficacy as the book goes on and he's increasingly placed in these situations where to him, he has this sort of Machiavellian viewpoint that unless he absolutely crushes his enemies, they're gonna come back and ultimately it's gonna lead him to harm. Now, I'm not suggesting that we take this lesson literally and go out and commit GBH on anyone who's ever wronged us. That would clearly be a very bad idea. But I think that there's really some powerful advice to be taken from this Machiavellian approach to dealing with your enemies. I work in tech startups and one of the sayings you hear again and again and again is this is a winner takes all market. And what that means is really when you're referring to the likes of Uber or Airbnb, these massive corporations that are heavily invested in, in software and in basically dominating a market, is you have to suffocate your competition if you're going to succeed. And these companies are very aggressive in doing that. Uber will expand rapidly so that it can offer the lowest rates to its customers so it can build that engine of growth and ultimately succeed. And I think in this sort of flat white toting, vegan eating generation, we think that business is all, you know, everybody is out to help each other. And while that to an extent is true, like you don't wanna be a dickhead when you're doing business deals, there's definitely a case to be made that aggression is required. Um, so even if you're not the sort of person that wants to channel that aggression and use it in a business setting or at work, just to understand that it exists and people are gonna use it against you, I think is a, a really important lesson that we can take from this book. The next lesson we're gonna look at is understanding the rules of the game that you're playing. Now, the book is called Ender's Game for a reason. As Ender progresses through the book and 
through his education, he's met with a series of challenges which can basically be looked at as games. And one of Ender's real powers is his ability to observe games as they're happening and to really deeply embed the rules within him. And I'll just read out a passage of the book to exemplify that point. He was too small to see the controls. How the game was actually done, that didn't matter. He got the movement of it in the air, the way the player dug tunnels in the darkness, tunnels of light which the enemy ships would search for and then follow mercilessly until they caught the player's ship. The player could make traps, mines, drifting bombs, loops in the air that forced the enemy ships to repeat endlessly. Some of the players were clever, others lost quickly. Ender liked it better though when two boys played against each other. Then they had to use each other's tunnels and it quickly became clear which of them was worth anything at the strategy of it. Within an hour or so, it began to pour. Ender understood the regularities by then, understood the rules the computer was following, so that he knew he could always, once he mastered the controls, outmaneuver the enemy. Ender's strategy to all the challenges that he faces is to really understand the first principles of the game that he's playing, and he takes on the position that he views pretty much every element of life in a game as some way. And I think we can apply this lesson to the real world as well. Creating a YouTube channel is really just about understanding retention of your audience, understanding branding and marketing. These are all micro games in the game of YouTube. Business is the same, it's just about understanding supply and demand, acquisition channels, relationships. You could even apply this philosophy to your personal relationships as well, you know, give and take. And at first it might seem a bit of a cold way to view the world, like surely life is more nuanced and complex than a game. And to an extent that's true, but it can also just be really interesting to try and understand how you can view your life in a game as some sort of way. I'd argue that those who can take a step back from whatever role they're playing in their life and try and view it as a game and understand the first principles behind it are going to be at a huge advantage as the next point is going to demonstrate. As soon as Ender really understands the rules of the game that he is playing, he exploits this to his advantage by seeing routes to victory that others don't see. And the best example of this in the book is when Ender's army, Dragon Army, are faced off against two of the other rival armies in the battle school, which his teachers have obviously set up so that Ender will fail. He's outnumbered and outprepared, but he tries an audacious trick. In the chaos of their takeoff, while Griffin Army held tight to their stars, the dragon formation abruptly changed. Both the cylinder and the front wall split into two, as the boys inside it pushed off almost at once. The formations also reversed direction, heading back toward the dragon gate. Most of the griffins fired at the formation, and the boys moving backward with them, and the tigers took the survivors of dragon army from behind. But there was something wrong. William B. thought for a moment and realised what it was. Those formations couldn't have reversed direction in mid-flight, unless someone pushed off in the opposite direction. And if they took off with enough force to make the 20-man formation move backward, they must be going fast. The lights went on, the game was over. Even though he was looking right at them, it took B a moment to realise what had just happened. Four of the dragon soldiers had their helmets pressed on the corners of the door, and one of them had just passed through. They had just carried out the victory ritual. Only then did it occur to William B that not only had Dragon Army ended the game, it was possible that, under the rules, they had won it. Ender realises that he can't win by the usual means by disabling the enemy because he's completely outnumbered, so he realises there's actually a different way to win, which is performing the victory ritual before he's actually disabled enemy, any of the enemy soldiers. And this reminds me of an example that I heard from Tim Ferriss, where he actually became the world kickboxing champion, not because he's a talented kickboxer, but he actually like looked into the rules and found that one of the rules was that if you push somebody out of the ring, then it counts as a point against them. So he literally just learned how to push people out of rings and defend himself from the blows in the kickboxing and actually ended up being crowned the world kickboxing champion. You could argue that all of entrepreneurship really is just about having the audacity and the goal to challenge the status quo and to try and find different and new ways of achieving the same goal that your competitors are trying to do, but in a way that's going to add either so much more value for your customers or something you're going to be able to do in, in such a cheaper way than, than they can. 
And I think that this can be applied to corporate life as well. I mean, it would be quite, I think, powerful to look at a role that you might play in the corporate world and understand how could I get this process done in a way that is either far more efficient or far more effective that no one has thought about before. Leadership through trust is the final lesson that I've taken from this incredible book. And throughout Ender's career, he gets more and more responsibility assigned to him. He's given command of more and more units. And one lesson that really stands out is how much autonomy he gives his lieutenants to achieve their goals. He had the army drill in eight-man tomb maneuvers and four-man half tombs. So that at a single command, his army could be assigned as many as 10 separate maneuvers and carry them out all at once. No army had ever fragmented itself like that before, but Ender was not planning to do anything that had been done before either. Most armies practiced maneuvers, performed strategies, Ender had none. Instead, he trained his toon leaders to use their small units effectively in achieving limited goals, unsupported, alone, on their own initiative. He staged mock wars after the first week, savage affairs in the practice room that left everybody exhausted. But he knew with less than a month of training that his army had the potential of being the best fighting group ever to play the game. Ender never micromanages, but he always has the patience to teach others one-on-one. -on -one. And I think this is one of the most important lessons that you can learn about just like general management practice. I think that one of the mistakes that managers will often make is they'll tell someone how to do their job. And there's a common saying in the business world, like tell someone what to do, don't tell them how to do it. And this is really powerful for a number of reasons. If you're telling somebody exactly like what needs to be done, it can be really demotivating because basically the person that you're telling what to do just feels like a machine just executing orders with no creativity uh, in their job, which is like pretty unfulfilling. And I've been really trying to embody this trait over the last few months with the small team of engineers that I lead in one of my startups. And I find that by being very, very um, specific with the goal that they need to achieve, but not at all telling them how to do it and just letting them you know, get along and, 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 and achieve it in their own way, it's a really great way of making sure that they're feeling fulfilled and that they're feeling creative and ultimately they're gonna deliver far better solutions if they're working in that way. So thanks a lot for sticking around to the end of the video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did, I'm gonna leave a playlist here, which is my the other videos in my Life Lesson series. So far we have Michelangelo and Van Gogh. I think that's it. Um, so yeah, check those two out. Uh, I'm sure you'll find them uh, helpful. Alternatively, if you didn't like this video or there was something you'd like to be improved, please let me know in the comments. I'm very early on in my YouTube journey and just really looking for feedback right now about what could have made this video better. So thanks a lot again for sticking around. Enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers.